the United States and therefore keep their land because they could do the math. They saw what was happening all over. And by treaty, they had land right about here, mostly northern Georgia. They laid down towns on the European style. They even did the most civilized thing they could imagine. They had plantations with slaves. So they thought, I know, they thought the United States would have to accept that while the Creek were more powerful, they still were not quite as civilized, whatever that means. But Georgia wanted them out. One of the most important court cases that's going to come out of this, and I'll explain Ross in just a second, was Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Remember the Marshall Court? Well, the Marshall Court ruled that the Cherokee, because they signed a treaty, were what they called domestic, so they're within the borders of the United States, but they're dependent nation. So they're technically independent, but they're within the United States because they signed a treaty. Because they signed a treaty, that gave them some kind of sovereignty. This court case still has precedent to this very day. And if you answer any removal on your on the test, you have to have at least one of these two cases. The other one, Worcester versus Georgia. Marshall Court two years later. And what it said is Georgia law does not apply on Cherokee land, not quite yet called reservations, because Cherokee law is sovereign. Montana has nine reservations, and if you know anything about reservations in Montana, there are different laws within each reservation, and they're different than the states. It's kind of a weird hybrid of the two. That is because these two still have precedent. And I had a lot of friends growing up in Miles City who were, Cher or were uh, Cheyenne. And I just remember how much different their, law wa their laws were. And they would tell me stories. And they're right next to the crow and they hate each other. And so I always thought that was just so interesting and fascinating to me. But the big thing I remember is that you'd get really, really, really dangerous fireworks there because they didn't have the same laws. That's what we call them. Sure, like Roman candles and M80s, <laughs> which are horrible things. You know what an M80 is? One A's a stick of dynamite. Good times. And let me just put it this way. I still have a hand. So with that, I threw one, and it exploded about a foot from my hand. No, my parents did not know I was doing that. I was like, damn. Yeah. Um. What was there? What was like the first court case where like they ruled with the Cherokee, but it was like a technicality thing? Oh yeah, it was sure. This it was this one, and the issue about the technicality was it wasn't sure about the laws. So they came back because Georgia said the law still applied. So they went back with this. Oh, so that's why. So that's why. In reality, they're very much the same. But say it's not clear about laws. Okay, well we have another case, and we're not going to go the details of the cases, but. What, these are really important names, still have precedent today. And so, there's an issue though. This is still 1832, 1833 when all this is going on. It is not clear the Supreme Court has authority over states. It is not clear. And to many, including Jackson, they made the very clear statement that Marshall, the Marshall Court, that's said, does they have authority? And they said, now, today, we just assume the Supreme Court and they kind of have authority. That really was unclear. So Jackson was not doing it by, he wasn't saying uh, the Marshall Court doesn't have authority because he was just wanted to find an excuse to ignore the court. A lot of people believe this. It was not clear until 1867 if the federal government has a certain authority and certain rulings over the states about rights. So he was not purposely disobeying the Supreme Court. Now, you could argue he had the choice. He could have said, no, wait, that's true. Cherokee are supposed to be there in the Indian Removal Act. Maybe it's flawed. So he could have done that. But it's not like he was ignoring it. But this famous statement, he did not actually say it. But many would add up his sentiment. He has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. He didn't say it that way. And the reason I put the line through and say it, because the book has it, other places have it. This implies that he was just ignoring the court. The hell with it, I'll do what I want. It's not quite true. Like all these things, it's more nuanced. Jackson was not just, I don't care, we're going to move 
these tribes. It's more complex. But once it became clear that this is a state issue, the Indian Removal Act said states will move them. Then one by one, the various tribes, the Creek would fight one more time, but they had been devastated, would sign treaties, including, and the states began to move them. John Ross would be the last leader of the Cherokee in Georgia. And I put this out, I put this picture because, notice his outfit? He's trying to dress and act like, as he see it, this white United States. How could they remove me? I'm just like you. Of course, that's not the point. You can act like, but you're not. As they would have seen how racist the society was, he wasn't white. And so he would eventually sign this treaty. And so all these tribes began to be moved. This map shows it just very generically. But they began to move. Once the Creek were defeated, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw would move. And they actually made these little horizontal, little soon to be called reservations, but eventually they pack it off when it's now Oklahoma. And tribes up here would move, most famously the Sauk and the Fox in this area right here. In fact, Abraham Lincoln would volunteer for the militia to defeat the Sauk and the Fox. He'd be elected sergeant of his unit. The Cherokee, though, they still said, we have the court behind this, and they resisted. Well into President Martin Van Buren's administration to where the American Indians would be moved. And eventually, all through the summer of 1838, they, they resisted and said, we have title to this land. We have reservations. And Georgia said, no. And finally, the U.S. Army moved them in what became known as the Trail of Tears. And we call it the Trail of Tears because a third of the Cherokee died along the way. And the reason they died is because they didn't go in the summer, it was the winter. And so you have exposure combined with outright negligence and incompetence by the Army. They didn't have food or supplies along the way. So many died that did not have to die. And they could have waited until spring to move. But by then it was like Georgia wanted that land. And I put down negligence or because many people believe they did that on purpose to kill them. And if I was a Cherokee at that time or had descendants there, I, I would certainly be open to that idea. It seemed to make sense considering everything else. There's no evidence that they purposely try to do that. But you know what? The net effect is still the same. If they didn't care enough to have food and supplies, how is that different than wanting to kill them? Think, oh, we don't care, so we don't have food. And this is during Van Buren's administration. So they have these, a lot of reasons why. But when the Civil War began, and you had all these tribes now starting these weird kind of horizontal little reservations here, they joined the Confederates. They blamed the United States, which is kind of ironic because it was southern states that moved them out. But that's the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. So they would actually not really fight building in that terms, but they joined the Confederacy. More than anything, just as for a little bit of revenge. And after the war, the United States would look very poorly upon that. And so the Whigs opposed this. And the Whigs made a big deal. Now, this is supposed to be a, another quote. Because, yeah, there was opposition, but that was humanitarian. Many Whigs were saying, How dare you do that? But of course, Democrats said, you're living in areas that the same thing happened there. That's hypocritical. But the big reason Whigs were opposed was they saw, they open up this land, there'll be more Democratic states. That was the Democratic Party. More Democratic states, the Whig lose election. This brand new Whig party that already sees themselves as a minority party, and they said, this is another effort at King Numbers to get more votes. And if you look at this, here's Jackson. Leading this caravan. This is a Whig lithograph. And it's showing these are supposed to represent. It doesn't say which tribe, but oh, probably the Creek. And it said the rights of man, because the Democratic Party made a big deal how we stand up for the rights of people. You know, we're the common man. And yet, how hypocritical is this? And, here's the and who's in the. Oh, it's yes. And the Whig. Well, which is anti-democrat, but I'm not put a slap there, but add this. Jackson considered this though, any removal, democratic. 
This is democracy to Jackson. And you might say, wait a second, you're moving people, don't they have self-determination? To Jackson, we're saving them, but here's the biggie. We're opening up, opening up this land for small farmers, small independent farmers. Who wanted yeomen and said yeomen would be the backbone of the country? What politician said that? Jefferson. And as Jackson saw, we are the descendants of Jefferson. I will fight for small, independent farms. So, I guess that's a monkey. That's all I got there. Well, while this is going on, another at the same time, Jackson's cabinet was torn apart by what's called the Eaton Affair, the Eaton Malaria, the Petticoat Affair. Eaton Malaria, and they're all worried about malaria. And the issue of this was the Secretary of War right here, Another Westerner named John Eaton, friend of Jackson's, he would marry Peggy O'Neill. Peggy Eaton. And this is a picture of Peggy Eaton. This is back you know, by the late 1840s when they started having photography, like derogotypes. And this became such a big deal. Think about Washington, D.C. at this time. This little tiny town. And you have all these relatively elite members of Congress and cabinet members, and they'd have these social functions. Because they're the only, only people there. So they all have to socialize together. Well, Peggy O'Neill had been divorced. She had left a horrible marriage. And then to survive in her home state of Kentucky, she had to work in a tavern. Taverns off your mouth. It would be a restaurant basically serve food. And that's what she did because she didn't have any other way to survive. Well, when she married, Immediately, the more wealthy, the elites, the upper class of the cabinet of Washington, D.C., started this whispering campaign against this new couple. Look what happens when you get these communists, these uncouth, immoral, ill bred, plain people in there. These people who do not know how to act, they are unethical. Peggy O'Neill wanted a cabinet. Women don't go to taverns unless they're white. Huh? Well, a tavern witch is that's a derogatory nickname for who worked there, but something even more definitely than that. Yes. A prostitute. A typical, typical lower class woman. And that's the kind of thing you get when you elect people like Jackson. And Jackson was furious when they quit inviting the Eatons to social functions. And they started making fun of her. In fact, doesn't this remind you of the attack on who's Jackson's wife? Rachel. Exactly like the attacks on Rachel. <laughs> this is a wig watercolor. And it shows Jackson's allies in the cabinet. Here he is like this um, leering, dirty old man. And they're having Peggy O'Neill do it like a risque dance in front of her. It's like it's turning the White House into a brothel. Which, by the way, we look at. I mean, that's pretty risque. Can you, can you not see your ankles? But the thing is, <laughs> but this is a. I mean, this is so classic. You know, upper class people are not are not like this. We are we are completely ethical and moral, which of course is absolutely not true. But nobody was seen as more of this elitist and ice the Eatons out more than this wonderful couple. So wonderful. The vice president and his wife. Who is the vice president? Yes. Um, no, Van Buren would be the next vice president. Yes. John <laughs> C. Calhoun. I know, he actually does. You know why? No neck hair. That's, That's Calhoun and wait, his wife. I swear to you I'm not making this up. Fluoride. And so... <laughs> So Jackson, who already hated Calhoun, Calhoun, who was of this old well, and Jackson, who came from nowhere, and Calhoun always believed that Jackson's talk about the common man would just talk. It's real. And so you have this cabinet that was ripping apart many of the cabinet Jackson would force out, and what became known as his kitchen cabinet. And these were informal advisors who eventually would become his cabinet because they were loyal to Jackson. Or as Jackson saw, loyal to the common man. Nobody more than Martin Van Buren, who came from very poor roots in Kinderhook County, upstate New York, up here, 
He would become the vice president. Really wily politician. Wily's a bad word. That almost implies that he's sneaky. He's a smart man. A lot of things I like about Van Buren. But I, don't like. I guess you say that about almost any politician or anybody else. Here's a weight cartoon showing like the whole edifice is collapsing around him. There's hills above. And here are the rats of his cabinet jumping ship. I just kind of like that cartoon. But Jackson started bringing in people as he saw representing the common man. And where did he see it? The common man? That Eaton affair. That was kind of like the divide. And Jackson, I mean, he took it very personal. And wow, so you have this and any removal blowing up at a time where this divide would never be more clear than in the nullification crisis. Now, let's be clear about nullification. Sometimes it's called the tariff war. And remember nullification about the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions? You remember way back when Jefferson and Madison nullified the Sedition Acts? It was still unclear. Remember the court case Marbury versus Madison on judicial review? That was still unclear if that really applied. And so here's Jackson. <laughs> okay. It dealt with that tariff of abomination. Remember the tariff of abomination? That increase, dramatic increase in the tariff. Now, actually, Jackson wanted it lower, too. But the tariff is on the book, and he has to enforce it because he's the president. Back in 1820, when the tariff happened, the vice president of the United States anonymously wrote the South Carolina Exposition of Protest. You guys need that care, right? If, you, if all of you grow neck hair, I'll grow neck hair. I'll give you five points extra five in um, all your math classes. I, yes. What's that? Is it possible? What is for men when they get the, someone got whispers all the way down to here, and then they just don't shave here, and it just kind of goes out? Maybe the general burn side. We'll get the burn side. We're coming. Well, in this, he said we should nullify the tariff. Now, he said that the tariff was unconstitutional. Well, the tariff was perfectly constitutional. So this was a purely political effort. But here's the thing. It was never about the tariff. Well, he didn't like the tariff. But the big issue was slavery. He wanted to nullify the tariff to protect slavery. And I'll tell you how in just a second. Underline protect slavery. Circle it. The whole nullification crisis was about slavery. The tariff was just a tool, an issue that dealt with slavery. So these two random arrows that are sitting here have a reason. First off, the South has no vision. So the Calhoun, that's no vision. The South has no industry. So they can't see what's going on in the North. But they have nothing to protect. And if the tariff raises textile prices, demand for cotton will go down. And so they're saying this is really going to hurt the South. So the South has no industry. And they also thought they had allies in the West because there's no industry in the West yet. Most of the industry is still around Massachusetts, New York, that area. Next, tariffs, all prices go up. And the money will go to the North. Not that the tariffs raise prices and the money will go up here. But they also said a tariff is a tax. If tax revenues go up, that tax money will go to northern interests. What was Henry Clay's plan? To do a bank, a tariff, and internal improvements. The American system. And that's what Calhoun is thinking. Okay, we get this tariff, it'll go to the American system, and they will build all this stuff up here from our money. Now, tariffs do raise all prices. I drew this handy chart to show you how. Here's British textiles, that's an R obviously. Here's US textiles. Price without a tariff, price, and I use 50% even though tariff abomination is 60%. Now for a 10 by 10 roll of um, cloth, rough cloth fabric. This is a rough cloth. 
It's about 80 cents, but we're going to say a dollar just to make the math easier. A dollar for that from Britain. So Britain was cheaper. In the U.S., the cheapest textiles were about $1.20. Britain had been doing it longer. They had bigger industry. They were more efficient. What do you call it? When a company is bigger, they are more efficient and therefore have a, a competitive advantage. What is that called? Economies of scale. Yep. So, 50% tariff, though, what does the price go up to? $1.50. $1.50. Do you see now why companies might want tariffs? Not only do they now undercut British competition, but what can they charge? At one forty-nine, tariffs allow domestic companies to raise their prices, and as economies of scale takes over and their costs go down, they keep their prices up. Tariffs artificially raise all prices, and so anything you buy with that have textiles in it, their prices will go up. I have a friend who's going to remodel, who's just going to remodel his kitchen in a couple months, and he was looking at cabinets. Cabinets are incredibly expensive. But the wood for the cabinets come from Canada. President Trump imposed a tariff on that, citing national defense. Canada, I guess, is going to attack. But the prices for the for the cabinets went up about 80% from when he originally looked at it earlier last spring. And the sad part is, and like a, his dishwasher will go up about 75% because of the tariffs. Now, my wife and I remodeled our kitchen last winter before the tariffs, before there were tariffs. And so he, I, I felt bad for him, but I'm really bad on him, <laughs> I gotta say. He was like, God, how much you have to pay? I don't wanna tell you. Which is still really expensive. You know, about kitchens. Well, lastly, yeah, these are the reasons the South didn't want the tariff, but it's not the tariff. Calhoun wanted an issue. He could unify the entire South together to protect slavery. Remember how the northern population is growing faster than the south. To protect the minority section, the minority section with slavery from the tyranny of the majority. And with that whole democratic rule and majority rule, he was scared. That was the whole thing about sen senatorial balance. So that is his logic right here. That's what he's thinking. And so do not forget, the whole nullification crisis is about slavery. And if they decide not to obey the laws, and the federal government says, hey, you've got to obey the law, then Calhoun says southern states have to do what? We nullify that is secession. And secession means civil war. So he's threatening civil war. The country cannot survive if one state decides not to obey a law and the federal government does nothing about it. Because that means no laws will be obeyed and the whole thing will collapse. Nullification, everyone knows it, means civil war. Or no U.S. Yes. You wrote this anonymously, but did everyone know Everyone knew. Right. So, <laughs> two things happen. First off, in 1830, the debate's a big issue, I mean, the, the tariff's a big issue. And one of the most interesting debates and dramatic times ever in the history of the United States Senate, at a time where they rarely even meet, which is kind of sad now, the webster hayne debate. And it ironically wasn't about the tariff, but it would turn into the tariff and nullification and civil war. They were actually debating what's called the Foot Amendment. Because there was a senator book from Missouri, but the foot amendment was going to make land here cheaper, which fits in with Indian removal, cheap land, so the poor here can get land. Robert Hayne from South Carolina. I wonder who else was from South Carolina. Hmm. He came out for the foot amendment because he wanted allies in the West because this would get people west, more people, more population. And he turned it into an argument about the tariff, and when the tariff, it turned to the argument about nullification, and nullification turned into an argument about secession. And that's on the floor of the United States Senate. 
Daniel Webster, a Whig from Massachusetts, and that's him right here, one of the great speakers in U.S. Senate history. He had this big, huge chest and a baritone voice, and they always said that the voice would rattle around his big chest and echo out. I'm not sure if that's the way the science works, but why not? He represents Massachusetts. Massachusetts was worried that if workers could get cheap land here, they'd leave their new factory jobs and go to Iowa, let's say. And what would happen to wages here if a bunch of workers left? Wages would go up, and they don't want to pay higher wages. So he came out against it. And one of his greatest speeches, maybe one of the greatest speeches in Senate history, he turned the fight against the Foot Amendment to a fight for union. And say that they are using this and the tariff as an excuse to break apart this country. And made it very clear, if you don't have the union, you don't have the Declaration of Independence. You don't have liberty. You don't have these rights. In fact, he would say, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. What a great finish to a speech. Actually, Webster's a complex guy. I don't know if I like him, but that's a great line. And it did, it did pass. But the point is now, this dividing line's happening. So it's kind of 1820, but even more violent. And then the Democrats had a dinner to honor Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had died four years earlier. On what day? July 4th. Who else died on the same day? Adams. Hamilton died. Oh, I gotta show you something. I'll do it later. But Jefferson and Adams. So who's around? Is there anyone like still around? Yeah, lots of people. Jackson was around. Of the founding fathers, almost all. But there are other people around. I mean, there, there just no one left by that point. Like, what are we doing here? We've got all these buildings and no one in them. But uh, and Hayne was Hayne was giving a toast to this, and they had all these people that were actually they wouldn't be allies for much longer, but they're also technically they all saw themselves as successors of Jefferson, even though we have elite and, and commoners. And Hayne was talking about the Union; it's important about liberty. And Jackson interrupted him and stood up with a champagne glass. In fact, he stood up and glared at Hayne until Hayne just sat down. But then one stared at Jackson. And then Jackson kind of looked around the room and then he found Calvin. And he said, Our federal union it shall be preserved. And it was like, okay. And then he goes to that one and get, you know, I'm like, oh my God. Because knowing Jackson, he might have jumped across the table and stuff. Pummeling him. But Calhoun then stood up. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Wait, am I supposed to stand up now? Yeah, you have to stand up now. No. And Calhoun said, the union <clears throat> next to our liberty, the most dear. Yeah, the union's fine, but if you deprive our liberty, what will we do? And by the way, liberty to do what? Have slaves. I want you to think about that for a second. The liberty to have slaves. So, Calhoun would quit. He would become the first vice president in American history to resign. And South Carolina would send him right back to the Senate. The second would be in October of 1973. And yes, I can remember this. Spiro Agnew Nixon's vice president resigned. He was taking bribes while he was governor of Maryland and kept taking those bribes while he was vice president. He resigned. He fit in quite well with the Nixon administration. But... The country looked like it was on the edge of falling apart. So these are two smokestacks, north and the south, imploding. I'm so confused. It's kind of scary. Isn't that amazing how they got that to work? So what it is is, you know how they did this? Look carefully. You see a guy right there and a guy here pushing. And then they push him so they, yeah. That building's not even touched. I, I can't. That would have been really cool to be there and watch it. That happened to East Helena. I made that up. No. <laughs> I think it's in Arizona. 
It's about two months ago. <laughs> so, oh, I thought that the 1832, 1833, I just thought that was a cool picture. I, I, I figured I'd somebody show you. Wasn't that cool? Wasn't that? That would be fun to watch. <laughs> So, in 1832, they did lower that tariff. Now, Calhoun didn't want it lowered at all. He wanted everyone to be really mad. But they didn't lower it enough for Calhoun. So, his home state, the next year, issued the Ordinance of Nullification. They said the tariff will not be enforced in South Carolina. I mean, this is a major step. I mean, this is one of those, like, a big step to Civil War. And Calhoun thought the rest of the southern <laughs> states would go with him. And they would force Jackson to accept it. In fact, they would meet in Nashville. The plan was for all these southern states, this big convention, to nullify the tariff. They called themselves the nullifiers. By the way, who was from Nashville? What person? Madison. Who? Madison. Madison's from Virginia. Jackson's. Jackson's, the hermitage, his plantation, Mr. Rodson, remember, remember the when he shot the guy in the head, Charles Dickinson, that was on the streets of Nashville. So this was like a slap in the face. Now, do you want to guess how Jackson reacted to this? Supposedly, Jackson was at his desk and heard, and he heard about this, and he stood up and said, by all the damn nation, I'll hang them all. He had a temper. He would have gladly hung them all. But, he did two, he also showed, he actually was a very intelligent man. First, he got Congress to pass the force bill. And the force bill says the U.S. will use its power to enforce federal laws. That's the hammer. I guess you could say, or like the carrot of the stick. This is the stick. But he did it really cleverly. To enforce the tariff, they didn't go, like, occupy Charleston. They used small Navy ships called... Uh, revenue for revenue cousins and they stopped ships just off the shore and collected tariffs there So they wouldn't have the provocative attack on South Carolina because if they would have done that Other southern states might have joined them And so instead he kept the, pro the provocation down, but he also made it very clear if South Carolina doesn't obey laws I will personally lead an army down to destroy it all And people believe Jackson when he said that and so the carrot was, behind the scenes, he began to work on a compromise tariff. Jackson's compromise tariff that would lower the tariffs dramatically. But Calhoun thought, I got the whole South with me. So Calhoun was way overconfident and told his state to turn it down. Calhoun thought, I got it. If they bring this compromise tariff, they're showing weakness. But no, that's not what anybody saw. All these other southern states looked at Jackson and realized he means it. If we join South Carolina, who we don't really trust, we'll have civil war. And we don't want to mess with the Jackson-led federal government. And so when they had the Nashville Convention, and guess who showed up? Nobody. Nobody came. Jackson totally defeated him and saved the union. Jackson saved the Union. If there would have been civil war, all over. Okay, so we got one more little thing with this, and then we're going to do the bank war. And then please look at the review list. There'll be a few things I'm probably going to take off. You'll like it last time. I'll just I'll let you know. Sound good? Lauren, you're nothing at all. Hey, 
I didn't read one page. I didn't read one page. Well, maybe I read one page, but I hated it. What? Okay, that's hostile language. No, no, everybody, you be quiet. It's people like you. Uh, 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 this is what I Here's the thing. So we have a wall. I used to go to hear. Everything in the cars are going to be, but this is all the ceiling. They didn't take off the ceiling. I said right on the other side of the wall, and I think they're the wall. Right above the wall ceiling, there's a lot of That's what I don't like. You know why? Because they did this on 30 seconds. In fact, the funny thing is, they got really expensive. Jot down this so after class, I'll take a quick look. Okay, Kate and Matt, and you know, I very well could have typed it accidentally down it or something. Vietnam, Matt. you want to go first? Okay, Kate's going first. Yay! Hey, you are filmed. 